From the Commonwealth Club of California, I'm Greg Dalton, and this is Climate One, changing the conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. As 2016 comes to a close, we look back at the year's most important energy and climate headlines, from the triumph of the Paris Climate Accord to the surprise election of coal-loving Donald Trump. It was a roller coaster year. It also was hot, and scientists say 2016 will bring the highest average global temperatures ever recorded as long as humans have been walking on the Earth. Why does a little bit of warming matter? Well, it amplifies droughts by accelerating evaporation, it hurts skiers by melting their snow and harshing their buzz, and even makes it hard on the grapes grown to make the wines that many Americans love. Before you reach for a stiffer drink, there was plenty of positive news this year. Bloomberg reported that for the first time, more Americans now work in solar energy than extracting climate-hurting oil and gas from the ground. The solar surge means running your home on the sun's power is now cheaper than ever. And Google announced that in 2017, it will run its global operations on 100% renewable power, mostly from wind. On the show today, we will talk about the autonomous cars and what else they might mean for moving away from fossil fuels that are disrupting the Earth's operating system. Here to talk about all that and more, we have three veteran journalists covering the energy and clean tech beats. David Baker is energy reporter with the San Francisco Chronicle. Katie Fehrenbacher is a former senior writer at Fortune, wearing the coolest shoes ever on those days. <laughs> And Cassandra Sweet is an energy reporter with the Wall Street Journal. Please welcome them to Climate One. <laughs> Cassandra Sweet, the Paris Climate Accord brought together almost 200 con countries uh, getting on the same page. Uh, is it a big deal? Does that matter to businesses that you cover in the Wall Street Journal? It is a big deal because there's a lot of global pressure on the United States to um, do something about its emissions. You know, we, we are one of the top um, energy users in the world and we also emit among the most greenhouse gases. And we're a rich country, so we can afford to, uh, to, to use new technology to cut our emissions. So there's a lot of global pressure from China, India, you know, Europe, other countries. Um, and there's an expectation among, uh, I think, consume, you know, ordinary Americans uh, that, that our government should do something about climate change and that other governments should be doing something. And now I think we're also hearing from investors uh, that kind of nameless, faceless group of people who invest in all the big companies that are publicly traded that we hear about. Uh, uh, though a lot more investors are becoming concerned about climate change and they're putting pressure on companies that they're invested in to do something uh, to, to, you know, have cleaner operations, to um, cut their emissions, you know, through energy efficiency and other things like that. David Baker, you cover Chevron. Uh, does Paris mean uh, anything for Chevron or other energy companies that you cover? Or is it some big abstract UN thing far away that you know, that's not really going to directly affect their business? Well, at this point, there's actually quite a split in the oil world between the US oil companies and the European ones. And the European companies have banded together and the European oil companies have banded together and said jointly, we need a global price on carbon. We don't care if that comes through cap and trade or a tax, but we need a global price so we can make the decisions over the time frame that we care about, which for oil companies tends to be somewhere in the 30, 40, 50 year ballpark. They've been very forthcoming, very forward about that. Chevron and Exxon and the American companies don't want to go there. Um, they're trying to sort of lay low in terms of public statements about it at this point, although Exxon has not been able to do that as effectively, I'd say, as Chevron. But, you know, I went to Chevron's annual shareholder meeting in San Ramon this, this year, and one of their shareholders got up and said, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. That's all I want you to do. And the CEO said, thanks, that's what we plan on. And that's sort of their approach. And the system, that's what they're paid to do, is make the yes. most money for their shareholders, including a lot of people. If you own an S&P 500 index fund, as a lot of people do, um, the oil companies are a big part of that. Uh, and so we're part of that. Katie Fehrenbacher, uh, Silicon Valley likes to think that it's far away from policy, Washington, D.C. The U.N.'s probably even another further away. Do the Paris Climate Agreement mean anything in Silicon Valley? Um. 
Probably not as much um, compared for the startups compared to some of the bigger energy companies. Um, I mean, Silicon Valley is in kind of a new era where they have to pay more attention to policy. You know, there's companies like Uber or Airbnb who are coming up against uh, regulators in, in different markets. And um, so I think there is kind of this new trend of startups having to pay attention to greater policy and regulatory issues. But I think in terms of Paris, I don't think there was a great deal of attention paid to Paris in the tech startup community so much. Certainly not startup, though. Uh, Facebook had a big presence there uh, at the, in the Le Bourget. I was there in Paris, and Facebook had with very visible presence, uh, but certainly the smaller companies, maybe not so much. Yeah, well, some of the big internet companies have made a, a big push to kind of embrace that for a variety of reasons. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the election. Well, obviously, one of the big stories of the year. Uh, earlier, uh, it was actually last year, Donald Trump uh, was asked by Bill O'Reilly of uh, Fox News about his belief in global warming. Let's hear what he said. I think that there'll be little change here. It'll go up. It'll get a little cooler. It'll get a little warmer like it always has for millions of years. It'll get cooler. It'll get warmer. It's called weather. I do believe in clean. And I've, I've received, a lot of people don't know this, I've received many environmental awards, many, many environmental awards for the work I do. And I believe strongly in clean water and clean air. But I don't believe that what they say, I think it's a big scam for a lot of people to make a lot of money. Donald Trump on Fox News. Uh, David Baker, what do we know about his, his policies and how he can he clearly favors fossil fuels? How's that going to play out? Yeah, we, we still don't know, exa don't know exactly. I mean, he doesn't always do and say the same things on a particular topic. But I mean, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, um, just in the last couple of days, he had a sit down meeting with Al Gore to talk about climate change. He told a couple of weeks ago, told the New York Times editorial board he was keeping an open mind on Paris. But if you look at his transition team and if you look at some of the names he's floated or settled on for picks for his, his cabinet, you have a, a stunning number of climate skeptics, contrarians, deniers, whatever term you want to use. And today, you know, today the big news was that he was picking the attorney general from Oklahoma to be the new head of the EPA. This is the man who has led the states that oppose the Clean Power Plan in suing the EPA. That same person who coordinated the lawsuit against the EPA would be in charge of the EPA. So um, <laughs> that doesn't really give me a great feeling about how effective Mr. Gore was in their conversation the other day. <laughs> uh, Cassandra Sweet, can Donald Trump uh, cancel Paris? Can he, you know, what impact can he have on that process? I think from the people I've talked to, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement um, is, is, I think the train has left the station in terms of uh, U.S. utilities uh, cutting their greenhouse gas emissions and using more renewable energy to, um, uh, you know, to, to bring about the emission cuts uh, that are called for under the Clean Power Plan, which is the Obama administration's uh, centerpiece climate policy. And that's a 32% reduction by 2030. Um, and the fact is, most utilities, they plan very far ahead. They plan 10 or 20 years into the future, and they've already made their plans. They've shut down old coal plants. Um, you know, other coal plants that don't make money are going to get shut down. Uh, electricity demand in the United States is flat or, or falling in many parts of the country. Um, and, you know, we, we still have a natural gas boom. Natural gas is very cheap. Uh, wind power is very cheap. And so the markets are actually... Uh, will, are expected to help the United States uh, reach its uh, its climate pledge under the Paris Agreement. I think the bigger question is what's going to happen after that? So I think there was an expectation that if Hillary Clinton were elected that she was going to, you know, push, you know, introduce new mandates, you know, past 2030 and, uh, you know, kind of tighten restrictions on pollution. And so I, I think people are not expecting that to happen. Uh, Katie Fernbacher, you cover Silicon Valley electric cars. Uh, are they doing this? Uh, the, the mantra in Silicon Valley is don't invest in policy dependent, uh, any company that's dependent on policy because you'll mm -hmm. get burned because you can never trust what the government's going to do. Are they going to keep moving forward or do you think they might change based on this political 
in terms of electric car companies yeah. and car companies in general. Um, I think electric cars are definitely coming. Um, I mean, you can just look at Tesla. It's kind of quintessential Silicon Valley electric car company, you know, m pretty successful so far. You know, they had their first profitable quarter in three years this year. Um, I, th I think everybody's looking at that company as kind of a leader. And then all the big car companies are, are following suit as well. Um, so I think electric cars are definitely happening. Um, but uh, not necessarily having to do with the, the Paris Agreement. There seems to be, every time I turn around, there's a new uh, electric car company I haven't heard of. There's uh, one called Lucid that David wrote about. There's Faraday. Uh, they're sprouting all over the place. Uh, are they all going to be successful? There's going to be some, some uh, pretty spectacular crashes. <laughs> they're definitely not all going to be successful. There's going to be some crashes, and we're probably witnessing maybe the start of some of the crashes right now. Um, but I think, actually, to get back to Tesla, I think Tesla and Elon Musk has inspired a bunch of these companies um, to uh uh, to be able to create an independent car company. So before um, Tesla, it was kind of this um, kind of known fact in, around in the car industry where it was going to be extremely difficult to be an independent car company. Um, so kind of Tesla and Elon Musk kind of broke that. And so now there are these um, new startups. They're focused on electric cars, but also autonomous vehicles. So they're investing a lot in computing and um, AI, um, and they're kind of redoing the form factor of cars. Um, and a bunch of these new uh, car companies are backed by um, Chinese uh, investors. So part of that is because um, the Chinese government put in a lot of incentives into um, developing uh, the Chinese electric car market, but also to give incentive to companies to create new electric car companies in China. Um, so that's going to be a big market for electric cars. So a bunch of these new startups um, are backed by Chinese money, but then also they put some of their headquarters in Silicon Valley so they can access computing talent here, but also for like brand purposes as well. So they're going to kind of develop the technology and design the cars here and then make and sell them back home in China? Is that the idea? Mm hmm Okay. Uh, David Baker, there's been an interesting uh, conversion, convergence really between uh, Detroit and Silicon Valley, uh, which used to be very different worlds, but now a lot of the auto, auto companies have uh, research and design facilities in Silicon Valley, and, and uh, you know, according to my 12-year-old daughter, a, a car is just an entertainment, mobile entertainment platform, right? There's more code uh, in a new uh, automobile than there is in all of Facebook which is quite staggering. Uh, so what does that mean for the, uh, what have we seen this year for the future of the auto industry? Is that, does that necessarily mean moving away from fossil fuels or is that just more high tech gasoline cars? Well, it, it's interesting because I mean, you say most of them have opened up shops here. All of them have opened up shops here. You absolutely, if you're a major automaker at this point, you have to have a presence in Silicon Valley. And they started that years ago, largely thinking about sort of the info, infotainment stuff in your car, the one that your, your kid's talking about, that kind of thing. But between the idea of electric cars and whether or not that's going to be the future, and then the idea of self-driving cars, that convergence is really what cemented the move and what has forced all of them to come here because the engineers who are good in those two things are here and they are not in Michigan, or at least not nearly as many of them. And it's turned into an interesting situation that I don't think really existed before in the history of the auto industry in this, this country in that, especially with the self-driving car thing, you've got all these automakers suddenly within the last couple of years coming out and saying, yeah, that's the future. That's what it's going to look like, and we're going to charge forward as fast as possible. And if you look over the, the past of the auto industry, it used to be that pretty much any new technology that involved safety or mileage would be something that they would develop, but they wouldn't really go whole hog and rolling it out until the federal government beat them over the head and said, you're going to do this. This time around, it's kind of flipped. They're still making more money on gas guzzlers than they do on you know, hybrids or electrics by a long shot. But this sort of converged future of self-driving, probably electric cars, they're going after it with incredible gusto. And the federal government under Obama, at least, basically just said, go, we'll be your cheerleader. We're not going to get in your way. It's sort of the flip of what, what used to happen. So yeah, I think, I think that train is leaving the station right now. And we're going to get that future, whether everybody likes it or not. 
Katie Schoenbacher, is, is Uber part of that? Uber would love to have, you know, no, you know, not have to pay any humans to just have the cars drive themselves. Yes. Is that a big part of it? Yes, definitely. I mean, Uber has been very aggressive on developing self-driving car technology. Um, they started doing this um, self-driving test run in, in Pittsburgh. Um, so they've been very aggressive. They bought a startup. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, Uber would love more than anything to replace all of its human drivers with computers, for sure, uh, reduce their costs and liability. Cassandra Street, what do electric, uh, obviously a lot of these cars need juice to power them. Uh, uh, there was a time when electric utilities looked at electric cars as like a pain, oh, they're gonna hurt our grid, well, we don't know what to do with them. Is that still the case? Utilities love electric cars. They love electric cars. They're big cheerleaders for electric cars and um, they're seeing them for, you know, more than just, you know, an, an opportunity to sell more electricity, which they don't mind. Um, as utilities in, in states such as California, so, you know, uh, here in California, we have a 50% renewable energy mandate by 2030. That's a lot of renewable energy to put on the grid. And even now, when I think we're, we're at 26%, um, there's a lot of solar power that's generated during the day that we can't use in California because we just don't have a place to put it and we don't need it. So utilities are thinking about uh, electric cars, uh, you know, to, to kind of give them more, uh, an opportunity to develop more infrastructure in the grid and they always make money off of that. But also uh, electric, the, the batteries in electric cars, if there are a lot of them, the utilities are looking at them as a storage device where they could just push out excess solar power to whatever cars are uh, you know, plugged in at the time, and then if that was your car, you'd get free electricity for it. Right now, the utilities are giving away excess solar power to Arizona, or in some, in some cases, paying someone to take it, because <laughs> it's just too much, and we're gonna have more of it. So I think electrification of transportation is definitely gonna happen in California, and other states, uh, probably Hawaii, you know, other states that have a lot of solar and have these very aggressive renewable energy mandates. Cassandra Sweet is an energy reporter at the Wall Street Journal. If you're just joining us, our other guests at Climate One are David Baker, energy reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle, and Katie Fehrenbacher, former senior writer with Fortune Magazine. I'm Greg Dalton. Uh, David Baker, another auto story this year was as soon as Donald Trump was elected president, the Alliance of Auto Manufacturers said, oh, those cafe standards that have been rising recently, we want to gonna take, you know, back off on those. And those, depending on who you talked to were the number one or number two most important things this country has ever done on climate, reducing fuel demand by a couple million barrels. And now, as soon as there's a political change, Detroit's saying, ah, not so fast. What is the impact of that? That's a big question mark. But they were going to be asking for that even if Clinton won the election. Um, they've already been escalating the, the mileage standards over the last few years, and all these by the way, in case you didn't know, come from California. They were originally codified by State Senator Fran Pavley, who just is leaving office uh, this month. Um, but the way they set it up, the way the federal government set it up, is the standards would ratchet up slowly for a few years, and then once he got past 2020, they would escalate pretty sharply. And the car companies looking at 2020, which is not far away, we're saying, okay, we don't have enough electric vehicle sales yet to make this work out. Can we get some kind of wiggle room as to when the highest of these, these standards hit? The thing, though, is they can't actually back out of it at this point, in part because they've already been planning their products around this for years to come, but also because these standards, even if Trump just waved a magic wand and eliminated them at the federal level altogether, they would still apply in California because we have special permission from the government to apply our own standards here in the state if they fight air pollution. We've had that for years. Plus, Canada adopted the exact same standards. So the and automakers- Several other states did as well, several including other New states York, did, yeah. I think Massachusetts, uh, it's at least a dozen. Right, so they don't, the automakers may want some breathing room 
but they can't actually even ask for really the, to abolish these standards because then they'd be in the situation of making very different cars for markets that are right next door to each other and they hate that idea. So even if the feds give them that wiggle room, they'll still probably need to come to California and say, okay, will you do the same for us? So that raises the question of a lot of people who've been t sad about the, the uh, uh, change in energy policy in this country, if California can kind of be the bulwark to defend the progress uh, the country has made. David Baker, you said California can on autos. What about other areas? Can California, how much damage can a, a big of a dent can a Trump administration put in California's clean energy pr progress? I keep asking people at the state that for the last couple of weeks. I asked that just of, of almost everyone I talked to. Um, <laughs> Tell us what they said. By and large, the, the thought at the moment is no. California, if California wants to keep pushing ahead, which Governor Brown definitely does, California can keep pushing ahead because most everything that we do is based in state law and not in federal law. So even if the federal laws change or federal regulations change, that doesn't change what we do here in the state if what we're doing is more aggressive than the, the federal level. You know, our, our cap and trade system is based on a state law our renewable power mandates that you were just talking about, mm -hmm. again, that's a state law. Uh, the fact that we no longer sign power purchase contracts with coal plants, state regulation. So there's not much that the feds could do to change Sandra that. Sandra Street, can, can California can they, um, hold the line? I agree, uh, Greg, but I mean, I'll raise you. There's other, we're not alone. New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Vermont. Um, who am I missing? I mean. I, guess, I don't know about Illinois. Uh, <laughs> they're going to have clean nuclear power. They have a lot of coal in uh, Illinois. <laughs> um, but no, it's not. We're not just. We're not alone. And so I think that um, there's going to be a, a continued push. Um, I've also talked to some people. I, I don't think this is on our agenda to talk about today. But I believe that the uh, actually. The Department of Defense is also very uh, committed to uh, pushing for more renewable energy. They do it very quietly, but they're definitely on that path, and I don't see them wavering from that, and I don't see Donald Trump being able to stop that either. So, um, I mean, some people I've talked to believe that the military is had some influence over Hawaii's 100% renewable energy goal. So I think that those... Uh, I see no reason that those states won't continue with what they're doing. And, um, you know, a lot of companies around the world are still coming here to California uh, to, to participate in our clean energy markets. And so I think, I think we'll be okay. You know, I think maybe if we had more support in Washington for clean energy, uh, for California's clean energy policies, maybe those markets would be bigger and they would grow faster, but um, I, I think they'll stay. David Baker, one thing Jerry Brown wants to do is, is link with nearby states to kind of get them into to sort of already California, Washington, Oregon are fairly green. The Democratic governors are aligned. In the past, that's worked out, but then there's been elections where that, that has faded away. What do you see as the, the regional potential for Jerry Brown or other Democrats to kind of keep a, have at least a regional approach along the, the blue coast uh, if, if there's in, in this new political context? Well, first of all, there is a push underway in Sacramento to create a, a Western unified electricity grid. And one of the main rationales for that is so that the states could share their renewable power with each other more efficiently than, than we do right now. I th That's going to be pretty hotly debated over the next year or so, but I, I do think that probably will happen and that will be kind of sort of an entry into this world. But, you know, in terms of getting them, other states to like join our cap and trade system, at one point, I think there were seven different states that said they were going to, and nope, they all dropped out at one point or another. Right. Instead, we ended up with Quebec, and Ontario is probably going to join us too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a state-by-state -state fight, and it depends on the political will in each state house. Carity Fehrenbacher, what big stories of 2016 have we not talked about yet? Um... See, I mean, just the fact that wind and solar were at their cheapest time in, in U.S. history. I mean, utility scale solar and mm -hmm. big wind farms. So, you know, Warren Buffett is investing massive amounts of money in wind, um, put big uh, utility scale solar farms in California. 
I mean, I think that's huge. And the first ever uh, offshore wind uh, project became right. soon to become active in, in Rhode Island. Right. Uh, so tell us about tell us about that. That's called Block uh, Block Island. Um, it's right off the coast of Rhode Island. It's the first offshore wind farm um, in U.S. waters. It's very small in size. Um, I think it's just five or six turbines. But um, but it's important because um, offshore wind is, is actually a large and growing industry in Europe um, and uh, uh, delivers a lot of electricity to European countries. So, um, and the U.S. has not been able to build these offshore wind farms before. Um, because maybe envi people, environmentalists get in the way? Yes, well, also because, I, I if you remember, Cape Wind was this big um, poster child for offshore wind um, on the East Coast, and um, a lot of people who lived in that area uh, didn't <laughs> want to see... Whose name happened to be Kennedy or something yeah. like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Didn't yeah. want to see the wind turbines... Um, offshore and um, that project was probably too big for the first one and it also was too close to shore so um, it riled people up but um, so this is the first one that's gotten built it's supposed to you know within weeks or days it's going to be connected to the grid um, uh, providing electricity um, for that area so that's kind of exciting and then that should be help develop potentially uh, more of an offshore wind market in the U.S. However, um, uh, Donald Trump is not necessarily a fan of offshore wind. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> he was against it um, uh, next to his golf courses. So um, we, you don't really know what he's going to do with that, but um, he, uh, it, you, don't, you never really know um, what, what he's going to do. But uh, it could be a big, a big uh, disaster. Cassandra Sweet. So yeah, I just wanted to add uh, on wind in general and offshore wind in particular. Uh, first of all, wind power is extremely cheap now in Texas and other windy states. Um, I think it's less than two cents a kilowatt hour, which is very, very cheap. It's a lot less than what we pay our utility. Um, and I think the thing that was keeping offshore wind uh, from being developed before now is that it, it was very expensive um, and it was much cheaper to build a big wind farm, you know, someplace where there was a lot of land and there's a lot of land in the United States. So most of the wind farm developers just focused on all the land that we had in the United States and nobody thought about offshore wind, but um, it's become a lot cheaper. And also uh, the New England states really want to use a lot more renewable energy, you know, similar to the, the kind of political ambition here in, in California to use more renewable energy, but they don't have a lot of land. And so right now they're mainly, you know, they're burning wood in biomass plants and they're getting uh, hydropower shipped down from Canada. And they'd really rather have something more than that. You know, they're, they're doing solar, but um, so I think offshore wind, now that it's a lot, uh, less expensive for them, it, it really could be, uh, there could be a boom someday. I don't know when that's going to be. You know, We're going to see it offshore California? I don't know. I think oh. our coastline is, the water is deeper. Mm -hmm. okay. And so that yeah. there's we like have a, a very small shelf. So you right. would have to put the turbines right up against the, the coast. And I think Hawaii has a similar thing. Yeah. Although, you know, there's experimentation with floating offshore wind. So, <laughs> right. but that's really at the science project level right now. We're talking about the top energy and climate stories of 2016 with Cassandra Sweet, energy reporter with the Wall Street Journal, uh, Katie Fehrenbacher, former senior writer at Fortune Magazine, and David Baker from the San Francisco Chronicle. I'm Greg Dalton, and we're going to go to our lightning round. We're ask a series of true or false questions to each of our guests, uh, starting with David Baker. True or false, closing the Diablo Canyon, Canyon nuclear power plant will cause California to get even more of its power from wind, solar, and other renewable sources. Eventually. <laughs> uh, Cassandra Sweet, true or false, uh, humanity is doomed because of climate change. No. Uh, <laughs> Katie Fehrenbacher, false. Uh, <laughs> false. You are more concerned about runaway climate change than you were three months ago. True. Uh, David Baker, oil, true or false, oil companies trying to block California's move to cleaner fuels are emboldened by having a fossil fuel champion in the White House. Still to be seen. Uh, David Baker, if there, true or false, if there is a climate change conference anywhere in the world, Jerry Brown will fly to it, <laughs> shake hands, and get people to sign a pledge committing cities and states to reduce their carbon emissions. Absolutely true. Uh, <laughs> 
Cassandra Sweet, true or false, many Wall Street Journal reporters recognize burning fossil fuels is disrupting the climate, but they don't dare say it around the water cooler or in write it in print. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that used to be true, but uh, I since, think it's... Since the Murdoch boys came in, there's a little more freedom there? We talk okay. about it around the water cooler. It's <laughs> hard to get a lot of stuff in print, so. Okay. Um, Katie Fehrenbacher, true or false, self-driving cars will put many professional drivers out of work, adding more fuel to the working class anger that propelled Donald Trump to the White House. True, but maybe in like 25 years. Okay. Um, David Baker, uh, true or false, you bring up climate change and clean energy at holiday gatherings with your extended family. <laughs> True. Um, uh, follow up. And it gets dicey. <laughs> and they enjoy you enjoy talking about such a cheery topic with you. Yeah. Uh, some yes, many false. Some true, <laughs> some many false. All right, that ends our lightning round. How they do? I think they did pretty well. Let's give them thanks for. <laughs> Katie, how do you talk to have that difficult climate conversation with people who are on? see it differently than you? Um, to be honest, I, I live in San Francisco, um, Bay Area. I don't come across a lot of climate deniers, to be honest. Cassandra, <laughs> do you have that difficult conversation? Um, yeah, I mean, I take a, a professorial tone <laughs> and just explain to them that, you know, there are a lot of scientists who've been gathering data on this for a very long time. And so it's not me, it's, it's you know, scientists who have um, you know, confirmed that it's happening. Climate change. So, quoting Pinhead's works, okay. <laughs> um, one of the big stories of 2016 was the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, and we're gonna, which you've all heard about, uh, protesting the rerouting of a pipeline across the uh, Missouri River, across some indigenous lands. Um, after months of organizing, organized protests, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers recently decided to look at a rerouting of that pipeline. Uh, here is a CNN report on the reaction to that decision. Drumbeats, cheers, and tears. The sound of victory for the Standing Rock Sioux and thousands of others gathered to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. This mass of humanity living off the grid, joined by thousands of military veterans, helped exert so much political and legal pressure, effectively forcing the pipeline to be rerouted. People have uh, said that now this is uh, either we make it or break it, and uh, I guess uh, we made it. CNN report on the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, that decision, of course, could be changed in a Trump administration. David Baker, environmentalists cheer when the Keystone XL is, is killed or de delayed, uh, cheered here where something is rerouted, and yet we all live in a fossil fuel world where we rely on that product. Environmentalists don't like the tankers that bring it in the Bay Area. They don't like the pipelines. They don't like the rail cars that might bring it. Uh, that oil won't come to the, United, to, to the Bay Area, but some other oil may come down from Canada. Uh, you look at the energy system broadly. Does stopping one pipeline really change the system? It's easy to say no, that it doesn't. And yet the fact that Canada's oil sands in northern Alberta um, are sort of bottled up and haven't been able to really expand production much in the last few years, indicates that altogether, yeah, that effort can actually at least delay things. Um, you know, the, the, the oils, many of these pipelines are tied to the oil sands and they're all about Canada trying to move this resource that it has that is landlocked to the coasts somehow to get it to the global markets where they can not have to sell just to the US, they can have more buyers, sell it to China, whatnot, get a better price, expand more of the production. And it's the Canadian government, even under Justin Trudeau, has a hard time giving up this notion that this is gonna be a major economic driver because they don't have many other major economic drivers on the horizon. And yet, you know, if you look at 
this battle that the environmentalists have waged pipeline by pipeline, they really actually have had an effect. It's not just the fact that oil prices are low right now that has kept the, the oil sands or the tar sands bottled up. It is this pipeline by pipeline fight and stymieing things every step of the way. And you can call it obstructionist, but it actually does appear to be working. Cassandra Street, there's an irony though here that some of that oil coming out of North Dakota is actually light, sweet crude that actually burns cleaner. So if you're gonna burn oil in a, a Bay Area refinery, don't you want the cleaner stuff rather than the dirty stuff? Uh, yeah. It is, but there's still that dilemma. I mean, people don't want pipelines running through their town, you know, or through their reservation or their, you know, sacred area or under their drinking water. And so, um, I mean, we've seen this also with natural gas pipelines that are proposed in New England. You know, in New England, a lot of people want to switch from fuel oil to heat their homes to natural gas, but they can't because there's not enough supply even though they're really close to, uh, you know, the oil boom in Pennsylvania. Um, there are not enough pipelines to get the fuel to them. And it's, you know, cleaner burning and all this other thing. But, um, you know, pipelines in general, people, people don't like them, even though they're safer than oil trains. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, I think what's really been driving a lot of the, uh, you know, environmental movement opposing these pipelines is the idea that we should keep it in the ground. And, you know, people, a lot of people believe that you have to take a stand, you know, even if, uh, you know, North Dakota, you know, Bakken light crude is, is better and cleaner than some of the dirtier crudes, um, we should still keep it in the ground. So I, th I think that's, that's having an impact. David Baker, one of the big stories in California, closing the last nuclear power plant in the state. Uh, I think some people were surprised by that. It's what, 9% of the state's electricity, Diablo Canyon is going to be shut down over seven years, replaced by renewables. Um, what impact is that going to have on the state economy and the state's climate plan? On the state economy, I don't think it's going to have a big impact. But on the San Luis Obispo County economy, it's, it's definitely going to. Um, Diablo Canyon is 1,500 employees, and I don't think that even includes the security force there, which is huge, absolutely huge. Um, but those are good jobs. Those are high-paying jobs. And, you know, San Luis Obispo County, it's, it's got the university there. It's got a decent wine industry and some tourism, but this was a big pillar. Um, the school, the main school district down there, Diablo's tax revenue to them was, I think it's 10% of their annual budget. So PG&E has actually proposed to the state utility regulators that, who have to approve this shutdown plan, um, PG&E has proposed basically giving local governments and school districts and whatnot down there $85 million over the course of the, the shutdown period just to sort of wean them off of the, the tax income that they would have normally had if the plant stayed open. Um, statewide, I don't think it's going to have a big economic impact. It will make it a little more difficult to meet our greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals, but not necessarily sabotage them altogether. The people who want to keep the plant open, and there are some very vocal proponents of keeping that plant alive, uh, are convinced that because when other nuclear plants have closed in the past, basically that switched, that just made people rely more on fossil fuels. They're convinced that's going to happen again. PG&E is saying, no, because we're planning for it so far in advance, we won't actually have to do that. We'll be able to replace it with renewables and energy efficiency. So there's sort of a lack of trust there on the, the plant's supporters. Cassandra Sweet, one of the big uh, renewable fights happened in, in Nevada this week. Uh, Bloomberg Business Week had a cover with Elon Musk and Warren Buffett duking it out there. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, Elon Musk packed Solar City, which uh, basically got kicked out of Nevada, partly because of a, a utility owned by, by Warren Buffett. So tell us the Nevada story. There's some other surprise things there with casinos actually going to run their slot machines on, on uh, solar energy so you can go play the slots and feel good about your burning. Sun. That's right. So, um, so in the election, you know, the same election that, uh, in which Donald Trump, you know, was elected the president, uh, Nevada voters approved a ballot initiative that will um, restructure, deregulate their electricity market so that everybody will be able to choose their supplier. 
and it'll be a deregulated power market like you have in Texas or New York. Uh, you know, we don't have that here in California. Um, and it all was pushed forward by uh, three big casinos, uh, Las Vegas Sands, MGM Grand, and uh, Wynn Resorts, and a big uh, data storage provider named Switch Limited. And it all started when Switch, which is a, a they run these data centers that use a lot of electricity, and um, they wanted to be able to use a lot of renewables. They wanted to buy renewables. They, had, they have a 100% renewable energy goal, and they were not able to do that because there's a monopoly utility there named, named Envy Energy, and it's owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. And so they asked permission from regulators to be able to leave the utility service so they could go out and buy their own power, and they were told, no, they can't. Um, and so the, the casinos were already along the way of doing the same thing, because uh, they want to be cleaner, and, and they've already uh, taken measures to cut their uh, energy usage. And uh, so it's kind of a long story, but it, it turned into this ballot initiative that would not just allow big companies like those ones to, to be able to buy their own energy, uh, you know, their own renewable energy, but, but everybody. So that includes residents and small businesses. And uh, it passed by a huge margin. And um, so Nevada's on their way to, to being a restructured market and, you know, it could bring back the rooftop solar industry, which uh, was shut down by regulators last year. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's people in Nevada are happy about it. You can go to Sin City and be green, right? So, <laughs> That's yeah, right. Perfect. It's all <laughs> um, solar powered. Uh, David Baker, you mentioned uh, Fran Pavley, state senator, former school teacher. She'd been a school teacher for 30 years, got into politics later in life. A lot of the key environmental laws in this country uh, started in her hand, in her authorship. So yeah. she's, she's leaving the uh, politics for now, uh, this year. Tell us, what's her legacy? What's she leaving? She has a really big legacy. I mean, even with this change of administration in, in Washington, those fuel mileage standards that we were talking about before, which were part of a law that she wrote in 2002, quite honestly, that's one of the single biggest factors in the fact that California has been able to cut its greenhouse gas emissions over the last few years. That's if you look at where the, the emissions have been dropping, they've been dropping in power generation and transportation, and the transportation is because of her. But yeah, I mean, she essentially rewrote the mileage standards for cars across all of North America. And this is a woman who did sp spend more than 25 years teaching middle school in Moore Park, California, just outside of, uh, outside of Los Angeles. So she had an amazing impact. Um, she wrote our big climate change law in 2006, AB 32. She wrote the sequel that Jerry Brown uh, signed this year, SB 32, which is gonna force us to cut our emissions 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. And though we are well on track to meeting our 2020 goals, that's going to be tough. That's, I don't know anyone who thinks that's going to be a cakewalk, but that's now the law, and it's the law because of her. So, yeah, she, um, there are a lot of people in this state who wouldn't recognize her name and wouldn't recognize her face. There are a lot of oil lobbyists and car lobbyists in Washington, D.C., who have cursed her name and know who, exactly who she is, but she's had a huge impact. She's been at Climate One a number of times, and she has said that uh, teaching children in middle school prepared her well for uh, serving in the state legislature. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can check out podcasts of, of Fran Pavley and others at Climate One and in iTunes. Uh, we're we're going to go to our audience questions and invite you to go to the microphone back there with one one-part uh, question or a quick comment. Uh, if you need some help keeping it brief, uh, I'm here for you. And um, so I invite you to go there now. Uh, we have 17 minutes left. We'll get in as many uh, questions, comments as we can. This is often the most interactive place. Who's going to be first? Come on, who's going to? Someone, <laughs> there you go. We know someone wants to be first, um, particularly if you're young or haven't asked a question before. We like to have young voices up there at the microphone looking. Um, Let's go to our audience wet questions. Welcome to Climate One. Hi. Um, I was curious if you could talk about the difference. You spoke about Trump and Paris and whether he'll hold to it or not. I remember George W. Bush pulling out of the Kyoto Protocols. What is the same or different 
with this less predictable situation. David Baker. One major thing that's different is that we, under Obama, Paris essentially happened because Obama and the Chinese government decided to make it happen. And it was that connection there between Obama and uh, President Xi that basically forced everybody else to, to fall into line. And Obama actually, under his administration, the U.S. really did become sort of a global leader in trying to tackle this issue and trying to set up a framework whereby we were going to tackle it. Back with Kyoto, I mean, we were very actively engaged in that, um, but we were not really the global leader in trying to take action. There's a lot of hesitation on our part. So it's sort of a whiplash kind of thing here. We've very suddenly gone from being a global leader trying to get this done, get this addressed, to probably just going on in the complete opposite direction. So that I, I think is very different. We're also 16 years further down the road with more disruption and hotter, more, more uh, climate killing uh, gases in the air. So the, the stakes are higher. It's later in, the, later in the game. Let's go to our next question. As uh, Amy Goodman might say, could you please talk a little bit more about energy storage? I was intrigued by what Ms. Sweet had to say about utilities like in electric cars as because of their batteries. I, I read recently about somebody who's like come up with a train that's moved uphill during the day and come to, comes down at night and pump storage. And I understand energy storage is a major constraint on renewables. Thank Katie, you. Katie Fehrenbacher. Oh, um, yes. Uh, utilities and power companies um, are very interested in energy storage um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one is a better way to manage the grid um, and add a kind of frequency regulation is what they call it. Another way is pair it with solar. So when solar shines during the day, store it and you can use the energy at night. Um, one major thing that is pushing energy storage forward currently is um, the cost of lithium ion batteries has dropped dramatically. So um, big companies like Panasonic, Sony, Samsung, they've been um, creating these batteries at scale for uh, power tools for cell phones for laptops so now they're becoming cheap enough that they can go onto the grid or even be put in the basement of a building or even at a home um, and that's one thing tesla has been trying to do it's trying to it's building this huge factory um, outside of Reno, nevada to drop the price of lithium ion batteries um, by 30 percent so they want to get batteries um, even lower um, and they're building some big battery stations there's one um, on the island of Kauai, um, and they're doing one in southern california um, with uh, southern california edison so um, eventually batteries will be even cheaper and be used more widely. Um, right now they're still a little, a little expensive. I would, I would like to add one thing to that. I, um, I guess this was back in July. I was uh, interviewing some of the people who run California's electricity grid, the California Independent Systems Operator out in Folsom. And they fully expect there are so many companies that are working on grid scale electricity storage right now, especially around the Bay Area. The grid operators fully expect that one of those technologies, at least, is going to pan out. They don't know when, so they can't really plan around it. But one of the guys I was sitting down with just said, when that moment happens, that will be the single biggest change in the history of, elect of the electricity system. And they, they're convinced it will happen. They just don't know when. David Baker is an energy reporter of the San Francisco Chronicle. Other guests today at Climate Water, Katie Fehrenbacher, formerly with Fortune Magazine and Cassandra Sweet with the Wall Street Journal. I'm Greg Dalton. Next audience question. Welcome. I, I've worked for EPA for over 30 years, and, and uh, now we got a new boss. And we've had both sides of the fence over the years. But energy's changed quite a bit. So now with natural gas really is what's, what it's going to be, and the coal industry not so feasible economically, what do you guys think is going to happen with all these promises to the coal industry, regardless of the, our pick? Where is this going to go? Because natural gas really is readily available. Who'd like to? Yeah, Cassandra Sweet, you, you've uh, written about Duke Energy. It used to be a big coal company, now more right. gas. Duke Energy is switching to gas. They've invested in uh, you know, gas companies. They're building gas pipelines. 
Um, they, they still have coal, but they're not planning to build any new coal plants. Um, and, uh, you know, one interesting thing, too, is that uh, some of the parts of the country that are, you know, considered coal country, Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, that's where a lot of the gas is now. So <laughs> there, there's been kind of this civil, sort of a civil war going on between the two industries. Um, but, you know, I mean, gas is going to win out because it's cheaper, it's cleaner. Uh, it's cheaper to build a gas plant. Uh, it, it requires uh, fewer people to run it. And so there, there's all these things around gas that are just um, just uh, overtaking coal. Uh, the oil companies like gas. Um, you know, they just have a better environmental profile. There still are issues with the methane that's released, um, you know, upstream in the uh, gas production fields. Um, and this is something that the Obama administration has been working on. This, this is actually a very important issue that I think uh, we just don't know what's going to happen under Trump. You know, methane, as you, you might know, is a lot stronger uh, greenhouse gas than CO2, than carbon dioxide. And so it, it is quite a big concern. But to answer your question about the coal, I mean, coal is just going to continue to decline. It's going to continue to decline, um, especially in Appalachia and uh, probably Illinois as well. Um, I think the Powder River Basin will continue to supply, you know, many of the coal plants that are continuing to operate. But... Um, yeah, I don't think there's much that Donald Trump can do to bring that industry back. There's a Climate One podcast earlier this year called Coal Wars, and we had hedge fund people here saying that, that you know, investors don't want to go near coal. Uh, Wall Street doesn't want to go near coal. Lots of financial pressures in that direction. Let's go to our next question. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to slightly change the subject and raise the issue of insurance. Uh, the nuclear power industry, to my understanding, was built on government protection or limitation of their liability that would not have been built if it had not had that protection from the government or the special insurance. Uh, so the general question is, what about the other highly liable uh, activities in energy? Is insurance an issue of uh, building these pip pipelines, running the explosive oil rail trains? Uh, so the, uh, sec the other item is I do not understand why we are not seeing the major insurance companies of the country and the world more involved in the climate uh, uh, um, greenhouse uh, climate because of their li liability around the peripheries of our continents for flooding and for the storm, the increasingly stormy weather is very expensive for insurance companies. So why aren't they Thank out in front? Let's take that one of the two. Let's take the insurance company. Uh, they actually have been quite active, particularly the reinsurance companies. Who'd like to take that one? I could take it. Uh, <laughs> Cassandra Sweet. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, insurance companies, you know, there just haven't been, hasn't been a lot of coverage of it, but they are looking at this closely. They've got uh, actuaries who look at weather models, and uh, a lot of the insurance companies, uh, well, some of the insurance companies are have been big investors in renewable energy and solar. Uh, they've been big, you know, tax equity partners. I think Hancock Insurance, not all of them, um, but I think if you went to an insurance conference, you'd probably hear the subject of climate change come up. Um, they are, they're pretty savvy about it. Um, you know, to your question about why they're not more vocal about it, that's a good question, because they're certainly very sophisticated about, the, you know, what they're expecting in the long term in terms of weather, in terms of sea level rise, in terms of, you know, more extreme, uh, you know, storms and droughts and things like that. So I think they're just they're probably just quietly, you know, changing their insurance policies and <laughs> raising their prices. They, they are raising their prices. There's something called risky business, which involved uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg, uh, Hank Paulson, former Treasury Secretary under President Bush, and Tom Steyer. Uh, risky business looked at risk to property and assets along the coast. So it has been done. And uh, recent New York Times stories showed that property values around in Florida and coastal areas at risk have rebounded less since the Great Recession than other parts of the country. So property markets are starting to reflect uh, the risk of sea level rise. Let's go to our next question. 
Hi, uh, my name is uh, Andreas, and uh, my question is, uh, it seems that during this election, you know, one of the big drivers, particularly from the Rust Belt, was around jobs. And as we've been talking about here, clean energy uh, is driving job growth um, at a highest, at one of the highest rates in, in across sectors. Um, you know, Tesla is building manufacturing gigafactories and in Reno and Buffalo. And um, so I guess one question is, why didn't we hear more about the clean energy job story um, in the media during this election cycle? And do you think that um, the clean energy job growth story can help to change the conversation around climate change? I think we didn't hear a lot about it. Just, I mean, in, in certain circles we did, but then in kind of uh, the kind of polar opposites, we didn't hear that story at all. I mean, I think it's um, the fact that Donald Trump it talks a lot about infrastructure and investing in infrastructure and the fact that, you know, he's not including energy infrastructure in that is a, you know, a real shame. Um, I mean, I think that also the solar and the wind industry, they do have, you know, lobbying arms, but they aren't as big and well-funded as the fossil fuel industry. So um, I think those need to grow and tell those important stories more. Well, also I would say, you know, um, it comes down to the candidates, too. I mean, Hillary Clinton had web page after web page of her plans for renewable power and the jobs that go along with it. She had all these plans for how to convert coal, coal country away from coal into a different economy. But actually out there on the stump, she didn't talk about it all that much. Not nearly as much as you might think for the amount of effort she put into trying to think through her policies on it. So, I, you know, I... I I reported on what her, her policies were going to be, but in a way, she didn't really help herself there anyway. She didn't really hammer home on it. She didn't talk about much at all. Conventional wisdom is because voters don't vote on those issues. They vote on things closer to home, pocketbook issues, health care, those sorts of things, uh, less so environment and things deemed to be further away. Let's go to our next question. Welcome to Climate One. You had touched briefly on the attempt to create a regional power grid. I believe you're talking about the West Coast, possibly with other states mm -hmm. uh, bordering California in order to share, especially the renewable energy. You said there's an excess being generated. Um, around the world, there is substantial development uh, and deployment of smart grid technology. I was wondering if you could talk about the prognosis for that here in the United States. Cassandra Sweet, you cover yeah, uh, utilities, smart grid. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, the smart grid is definitely going to take off, and again, you know, California utilities are, are leading the way on that um, because microgrids are, you know, like the way that uh, the, the California utilities look at this question of how to bring on a lot more renewable energy uh, is to create more kind of um, networked smaller grids that talk to each other and share energy, but not like this, you know, this hundred year old system that we have is kind of started with these big power plants with a pipe, you know, that just brought the electricity one way to cities and towns. And um, this new system is going to be, you know, kind of d different sizes of grids all connected together, but it'll look more like the internet where you have, you know, computers and, and other devices that are connected together. Um, and, and that's the smart grid, I think. Um, that's new technology. The energy industry, the, the power industry has been kind of slower than other industries in really like inventing and using new technologies, you know, like the way we're used to seeing with um, uh, smartphones and social media and things like that. But that is changing. Uh, the renewable energy mandates are driving a lot of it. Um, but the utilities are also discovering, um, you know, new benefits to these, uh, to these new technologies that create a smarter grid that can solve other problems and can save money that they might otherwise have spent on uh, conventional, uh, you know, power equipment and things like that. So I think it's definitely coming. I don't know how long it's going to take, but uh, utilities in California and New York are leading the way on that. Let's go to our last audience question. Welcome. I wonder if you could comment on the sort of human cost of uh, climate disaster. The I'm thinking of large migrations, people who have been affected in coastal communities in Alaska and the Pacific, and probably many 
larger numbers of people whose agricultural lifestyle is become untenable and how do how does the human cost become reflected in policy or uh, industrial thinking or you know any any place that raises that as a, a level of importance in our dialogue there's this term called the social cost of carbon um, who'd like to tackle that one Cassandra sweet I can actually take it. I talked to a, a really a fascinating climate scientist. His name is Ram Ramanathan, and he's at the Scripps Institute in San Diego. Um, and he's been a, clim a climate scientist for a long time. Uh, he, is, he is working with the Pope, Pope Francis, um, and the Vatican uh, Science Academy of Sciences, along with a lot of other scientists from around the world. And uh, it appears that Pope Francis is very concerned about climate change because of the impact on poor people, because they feel the brunt of, uh, of the extreme weather that results from climate change. And my understanding is that um, the Vatican is planning a symposium of all religions. And I'm not sure, I, th I think it's coming up, uh, for religions from all over the world. So imams from Iran, uh, you know, Hindus, Christians of all kinds, you know, Jewish, you know, sects of all kinds. So it's just going to be like this major world conference. And uh, Dr. Ramanathan and I think other scientists are, they've become frustrated with political leaders and they're now turning to religious leaders to, you know, try to um, bring together a grassroots movement. So there, there are people, I guess in answer to your question, there are people who are doing things to fight climate change on behalf of the poor. Uh, we have to wrap it up there. We've been talking with David Baker, energy reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, Katie Fehrenbacher, former senior writer with Fortune Magazine, and Cassandra Sweet, energy reporter with the Wall Street Journal. I'm Greg Dalton, host of Climate One. I'd like to thank our audience in the room here in San Francisco and online and on air. Thank you all for being part of tonight.